Good evening, everyone, and welcome to day number 205, coming to you tonight from Ukraine. Um, quite a day today, really with a lot of news, and I'm sure that many of you have already seen the news, you've been watching your news from wherever you're watching um, in the U.S. and around the world, but I want to give you some updates on how it's being perceived here in Ukraine. Additionally, tonight, I have a great video clip I'm going to show you um, something interesting that happened during a meeting I was having this afternoon. And also tonight, I'm going to talk to you about soldiers, Ukrainian soldiers. So we'll get to all of that. So what's been happening today? Um, quite a bit, quite a bit. And I'm going to try to bring a little clarity to what has happened because there's so much out there, so many stories out there. I'm gonna give you tonight the inside Ukrainian look, the viewpoint here with what's going on, and I think it will help round out your entire viewpoint um, from wherever you are also getting your news from. Where do we start? We'll start with the battle in the east, and that would be over there near Izum. Yes, Ukraine won a major battle there in the Kharkiv Oblast pushing down towards Donetsk Oblast and pushing down and over um, east towards the Lugansk Oblast. Ukraine won a decisive battle. They have retaken Izum, and we've known for months that Izum was a city that was a major um, focal point for the Russian army. Now, we were not very far from Izum the other day, um, and in preparation for our next run out, which will happen next week, we may be heading that direction. Um, we'll see, but we'll definitely keep you up, updated as to that. But we're kind of looking in some of that area. There's a lot of issues there and needs there, especially with the military and also with people that are still there. So Izum, major battle. But we know also, you've seen on your news that mass graves were found there. That the evidence of people being tortured is there. That is the truth, folks. One grave there alone had 400 people in it. That city is completely destroyed, gone, every building damaged. Um, the evidence of people being tortured. So I have a question for you tonight. I want you to think about this for just a couple of seconds. <clears throat> what is it going to take for nations around the world, other than some of these small bulldog nations like Estonia, um, to declare Russian regime there at the Kremlin a state sponsor of terrorism? If that's not terrorism, then what is terrorism? You see, there's so many more things at play here. Um, on the global economic scene, on the war scene. But the bottom line is, it's a terroristic regime led by Vladimir Putin, and there's nothing else that is needed. This should be done. But of course, we have weakness there in many parts of the world. So question for you tonight. Number two, looking at it from the Ukraine side, is Russia going to respond to this? Let me answer that. Absolutely. We have many people around the world scared and afraid that they're going to drop a tactical nuke. They're listening to the propaganda. And yes, they're going to drop the tactical nuke on Vinitsa, which is an hour that way. Or they're going to drop the tactical nuke on Lviv or Kiev or Nipro. <sighs> you remember when Russia said, if... Medvedev says this, said this, if any strike happens on Crimea, then it will be judgment day for Ukraine. That was probably 45 days ago when he made that statement. Ukraine has been ripping Crimea with a lot of behind the scenes work. Has there been a judgment day? Of course not. Is Russia capable of that? Absolutely, yes. But is it going to happen? I don't think so. I think what's going to happen is 
there will be some type of, I'm still going back to the Zaporozhia nuclear power plant. There will be some type of accident there so that the blame can be pushed over onto Ukraine or over onto NATO, whatever it may be. But this is what's happening. Is Russia going to respond to what's happening in the East? Yes, they're already responding. First of all, they're responding in words. They have stated that the reason we have had to pull back and we've lost that battle there in Izum is not because of Ukraine. It's because NATO is here fighting for Ukraine and with Ukraine. Russia came out today, Putin came out today and said that Germany has absolutely crossed the red line and there is no return from that and that Russia will respond. Russia also stated today that if the United States provides any longer range weapons to Ukraine, which they are currently planning to do, that they will cross the red line. Okay, cross it. Finally, be bold. Be bold. Do not be afraid. What are you going to run away from? Be bold. You have to win this war. If not, they're coming for everybody else to stamp out democracy. We know that. We've got a great push now. Is Russia going to respond? Absolutely. Are they reinforcing in the south? Yes. Are they going to reinforce in the east? Yes. Are they going to continue to drop missiles and shell and do all the things that is happening currently? Yes. Are they going to make pushes back? Yes but we're going to defend against them. Belarus today, Jamie was just talking to me just a few minutes ago, Belarus today is increasing their activity and even, even threatening pushes in up in that northwestern part, which would be kind of straight north of me right now where I'm located. That would be in the Volin area. That will be in the Rivna and Zhitoma regions up there north on that Belarusian border, especially over toward the, that western corner of Volin and Rivna. Are the nuclear power plants throughout Ukraine, four major ones, already threatened? Absolutely. Is electrical grid and infrastructures being attacked? Yes. Are they going to continue to respond? Yes. But now is the time to show ourselves stronger and stronger and stronger because we have made a decisive blow. With that said, this is some of the things we're looking at tonight. On our next run, which we are preparing for even now, our focus is going to be on the military. Right now, it is extremely difficult on the Ukrainian military um, because it's getting cold. I'm just, it's getting cold at night and it's wet. It has rained about seven days in a row here in Ukraine. There's been a little sunlight here and there, but every day there has been good rain. I have been right up at the foxholes. I've been on the lines. I'm looking and seeing what they need. And it's ugly. It reminds me a lot of that trench warfare that we read about or we've watched documentaries about in World War I when the trenches would fill with water and it would be cold and they'd have to build platforms to stay above the water. And it was just a challenge. Ukraine and Russia both, they're facing that right now because it's so wet. And then when it's moist like that, it's rough. So our focus on the next run, yes, we will be taking some food to people that need it, but it's not our focus on the next run. Our focus is the military, warmth, gloves, other things that we will have to be taking and delivering to them. Um, so we're working on that and we'll be updating you more on that. Let me flip over the page here. Um, let me see here. Yep, I'm, I'm right where I need to be because I'm doing it all by memory tonight. I'm on the road. Um, so that's what we're going to focus on. Now tonight we're going to answer the question on how do we know where to go? How do we know which military to meet? And this was some of the things I was sharing with you last night that would be interesting tonight. 
And um, I, I think you'll enjoy hearing about that. But before we get into that, I want to show you something that happened today. Today we were in a meeting and we were working on things and we're, we're locating product, we're locating gloves, we're locating blankets, we're locating other things that we will be carrying out to the front lines and it takes days to make all of this happen. Plus, to be honest, we're zonked. That was seven days of very, almost seven days, six days of very difficult, nonstop running and gunning. And then, of course, being under the pressure of being there on the front lines. In fact, tonight, you guys remember Jamie in prayer. He's a little bit under the weather, um, headache and stomach ache. And I just told him, I said, listen, I know you're tough, but the tough one's here. And um, so I, I don't, I, I've put him down. And, but it's all good. He's resting and, and he's actually starting to feel a little bit better. So hopefully tomorrow back to full, full power for him. Um, with that said, we had a meeting today. And while we were meeting, I noticed that the young fellow that was serving the coffee had a unique t-shirt on. So I spoke to him and I asked him, I said, do you mind if I talk to you a couple of minutes? He says, no, let's have a talk. Um, just a couple of minutes here, and I think this will, inter uh, will interest you because he's from the Melitopo region and specifically from the city of Tokmak. Check this out. Pretty cool exchange with this young fella. Hey guys, we're here in Khmelnytsky, Ukraine, of course, getting set up and ready to go for the next run and working on some logistics things. Come by to get a coffee, to have a meeting, and I see my man's t-shirt here. So you guys know the city of Melitopol, you know Tokmak, and you're from Tokmak. So just a couple of questions. Um, you were there when the war began. Yes. How was it? What was it like? Just in a three or four sentences when you were invaded. Ну, як спочатку, то есть, понятно, все думали, що це скоро закінчиться, що зараз просто їх всіх виганять, да, там все не получиться, но потом начали понимать, що нам все затягується і, скажем, не хотілось та неприятних послідків для себе, да, я молодий чоловік, там вже зовсім возраста. Якщо вже йти захищати, то за своїх лучше, ніж за вот это вот все. І no, but when you were evacuated and left, yeah. was that difficult? Through to Yeah, it's difficult. Well, the reality is actually here, so we have um, Tokmak. Another employee is from Salpitka. That's where we were in Kharkiv, and it was very dangerous there uh, uh, 10 days or so ago. And then the other person here working is from Kramatorsk, where we were yesterday. And when we told Anton what we're doing, you know, he was very thankful. Thank you very much. Um, but I want you to know that there are people watching all around the world that support you. Same thing. That support Everyone. Ukraine. Everyone. Same thing. And uh, you're going to be back in Tokmak soon. Yes. We love you. Okay. Good job. Thank you. See, it's crazy. This, like, I know this city, Khmelnytsky, very, very well. I know every street. I know everything about this city. And I'm shocked how many people are here, how many cars are here. And what it is, there's so many refugees here. And you see that whole mag that whole coffee shop there, all refugees. So it it tells you that this really is a major problem. But Ukraine's making a push. We're gonna reload our buses up and uh, we're heading back to help the soldiers because we're gonna finish this war pretty quick. So there you go. That's a real story from somebody who got out from occupied territory. That was super cool to see that young fellow there in that t-shirt and be able to communicate with him and give you a look into the city of Malnitsky where it is completely full of refugees, completely full of displaced people. You have an inside look there. You can hear a few stories from someone who had to escape 
the occupation. I think the best thing he said was the statement, and I know you're reading the subtitles, but he stated, you know, I had to get out because I'm of fighting age. And if I had stayed and remained in the occupation, then they could draft me to fight for them. So I had to get out so that I could fight for my nation. I want to defend my land. So it gives you insight real insight as to what really happens here on the front. Now, with that said, our next push and our next phase is to support the military. And I know that many people that watch have questions about how do you know which military to go to? How do you know what they need? Because they're there on the front lines. How do you guys get access to get to the front line, to get through all the block posts and all the security? How, how does that happen? So tonight, I want to explain that to you. Um, Jenny and I were going to do that together, but my fellow's uh, under the weather a little bit, so I'm going to take care of it tonight. Six key areas right now that are being fought for in Ukraine, and they would be Mykolaiv region, Mykolaiv city, Kherson, which you know about, which is occupied, Nikopol, which is there across the river from the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant in Energodar. And then you wrap around to Zaporozhye and from there into Donetsk region where we were. And up from that, the Kharkiv region. There's only about 3% of the Kharkiv region that is still occupied. The best way that I can explain this to you, and for those of you that may be older and you can remember this, um, especially if you're from America and you're watching and you remember the old show Hogan's Heroes and Hogan's Heroes, the guys were in the military camp there and many episodes would be about the underground helping. And who was the underground? The underground were civilians. Some of them were German, some were French, some were Brits, some were Americans, but they were working together to help the military. Um, that's basically what happens here. Now, how specifically, for example, do we know where to go? How do we know that this group over here needs 12 gloves, six power banks, 30 pair of socks, and 40 cans of beanie weenies? How do we know that? Well, let me explain to you how it happens. First of all, everything that is done through our nonprofit here is co coordinated directly from Xenia to military commanders. And they are the commanders of the guys that are on the front lines. You have to have that relationship. Well, how does that relationship come? Well, it comes over many years. Xenia has been doing this and supporting the military since the war began, which is not February the 24th, 2022, but actually 2014 in Maidan. The second thing that we also have to do is not only communicate with local commanders, but we have to communicate and coordinate with local runners. You say, well, who are the local runners? Local runners are volunteers. Many of them are former military. Many of them are a little bit older, and their job is to make the connection between the volunteers who are coming in and the military. Um, when we were down south in Nikolaya, we were running with a runner. And the runner knows everybody because he's driving there. I mean, like everybody. He knows every position. He knows where everything is and everybody knows him, you know, the soldiers. So there's a level of trust there. Why is this trust needed? It's needed because there are so many spies here. So how are there so many spies here? Because they can speak the same language, Russian. Yes, Ukrainians can speak Ukrainian as well, but everybody can also speak Russian. So the spy issues are major here. This is why all the blog posts, this is why all the deep searches, this is why when we come to a blog post and when we pull up to the blog post, I'm literally sitting over next to Genia and my American passport is out. I have it on my knee. We have the right van. We have the right marking. Xenia has his documents. I'm wearing my, well, I've got my American t-shirt on the night, but I'm wearing my Ukrainian t-shirts. I have my Ukrainian hats on. And they look and they just look and they see the passport. And they'll say, ooh, American. And Xenia will say, yes, we're here working together to help. 
and then say, okay, they do a quick check and it helps us get through. Um, so these local runners and military commanders. Now, you cannot just come over here to Ukraine and say, I wanna go volunteer and take socks to the military. You're not getting anywhere because there's no trust. The third key thing that happens for these military deliveries and military coordinated um, drops is trust. Only contacts with personal relationships can function. So there has to be a relationship developed. You remember a, f a couple of weeks ago when we met that uh, gentleman in the gas station there up near Poltava and we told you it's a very important contact for us? Of course it is because he can validate us to, to certain people. Um, fourth rule, no food can be accepted by the military unless it is a double verified contact. So what? Yeah. It's unbelievably coordinated and unbelievably crazy. Oh, well, why would that be? Because they get poisoned. I know you're sitting there tonight going, you're crazy. I said, no, I'm not crazy. I'm in a war zone. They get poisoned. So they will not accept food unless it's double known contact because they don't want to get poisoned. Meeting places and times are established. How do we know where to go? Sometimes we get right to the front, right to where the foxholes are. Literally, you're looking at it. Other times, we may meet three kilometers over here at this meeting point. We come up real quick. They're already sitting there. We do the drop. We do the delivery. We encourage them. We, we shake hands. We hug. We high five. I showed you pictures of soldiers that have no gloves. That's meeting places. And then they're gone and boom, we're gone. Why? Why do we have to go so quickly? Drones. I know y'all are going, okay, man, you're out there tonight. No, I'm not out there. I'm telling you and giving you insight in how this happens. We have to roll so fast. Why? Drones. Because the drones are up in the air and they'll see coming into that front line, the volunteers. And we're in this black van. And here it comes. And then they see the military trucks coming. Well, what are you going to want to hit? That meeting. Why? Because they don't know what's being transferred. Are they watching? Of course they're watching. We deliver many times and the Russian forces are right up on the hill. We can't see them, but they're there. Well, who's telling us that? Military and the runners. Everything is super coordinated. It just doesn't happen. Um, let me give you a little more insight. Mikolaev, Harrison region. I have a good, good friend in the United States. His nephew is fighting there and on the front lines and he needs some supplies. But even though I know the guy in America, I can't just go down there and say, hey, give me his phone number, I'll take him some stuff. That's not how it happens. But right now we are in process of making the right contacts. So my buddy that lives in America is talking to his nephew on the front line saying, listen, these people, Greg and Jania, are there. They have supplies to bring you. What do you need? Let me verify them to you. So you have an uncle telling a nephew these people are legit. The next thing that will happen is the soldier there will tell his commander. The commander will then contact the guy in America. Through the nephew, they'll make a talk. They'll make sure it's real. At that point, then he has permission uh, to contact Jania, or the number will be given to Jania. Then Jania makes that contact. It's all these double checks. It's super cool, but it's the way it must happen because of security, of danger of poison, of spies, of people getting in where they shouldn't be, and it's dangerous. So it has to be double verified. That's why many times people say, well, do you feel safe doing what you're doing? Yeah, actually we do. We're, we're not, Stupid. This is really double check. Can anything happen at any moment? Of course it can. It can also happen to you right there where you're at driving to the mall or to Chick-fil-A a little bit later. Yeah, of course, we're in a much dangerous place, much more. But we're doing everything we can by the book. You remember the first couple of days when we were doing the Kharkiv run and on our video was Jenny uh, me, Jody and Sasha. Sasha has now been deployed. He is on the front lines in Donetsk. He's in special forces. 
He's already communicating with us. Now, you, of course, you know he's a boss. He's already communicating with us. I'm here, guys. This is my guys. And these are some of the things that we need we do not have. So that relationship's already built. We're already working on the list of things that Sasha's group needs. And yes, we'll run it right there to him and we'll see Sasha. It's how it works. It's kind of crazy, but it's very good, very organized and very secure. I hope that gives you a little bit of insight tonight on how that happens. Now, what really makes you happy and joyful is after that happens, you get to see this kind of joy. Дівчата, дякуємо вам за ту шоночку, що ви сподобали нас за гостинчики всі. От що-то кроме винограда пожрав. Нам на передовій тут все буде в яблучко якраз. Це це моє, це не забирається, це не можна роздавати. А це тоже. Це не сок. А я я я я. Это дока не ма, блін. Это бы долго оставить. Так что будем а, говорить, как вы поднялись. Все, налетели корши. Да, да, дякую, девчата. Дайте мне шоколад, долго оставить. Дайте шоколад. 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 Зелене, не підніми свою голову. А це піво. Побратим. Півка, да. Чим це є, це піво. Побратиму Вальтера також дуже велика подяка. Ні, спасибо, дуже класне печення, кофе, це просто... Well, folks, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this update tonight. I've updated you on the news, especially from the Ukrainian side. You've seen a refugee come out of Tokmak and give you a, a little bit of insight there. And then... You've been on the journey with us to get a little bit of insight how all of these connections work to make it happen where we can assist the military. And finally, you saw the joy. Appreciate you guys. Tomorrow, full day, we're working on the loading process. We're working on the coordination process. All the things I taught you about tonight in those steps, that's all happening tomorrow and Sunday um, as we prepare for the next run. So may the Lord bless you tonight. Peace to you and peace to Ukraine. We'll see you tomorrow night.